Thank you, Luke. So it's firstly I want to thank my colleagues at Orsay and in London for this this uh, very nice invitation, which I really appreciate. It's it's like I always feel it's like waking from a dream when one comes from the the marshes to East Anglia to uh, to here in in Orsay especially. In fact, I never was, in the time I was at Orsay, Jean-Marc was not there, he only arrived later. Um, but I, I think the time which I really got to know him best of all was when we suffered what I think was the worst journey in my life, together. Because p p people don't realize today, but this is long ago in about 1980, but the, the only inexpensive way, so we were both invited to the Institute for Advanced, uh, to, to Princeton. Yes. And the only inexpensive way of getting to, uh, across the Atlantic from Paris was with this, this incredible arrangement, I think with Icelandic air, <laughs> that you had to, we had to first get a train in the middle of the night <laughs> to some capital, maybe Boston. in Luxembourg. Luxembourg, exactly, <laughs> and then then we flew to uh, Iceland, and then we spent a few more hours uh, w waiting in there for the next flight to take us to New York, and then finally, when we got to New York, we had to wait hours again for a bus to take us to Princeton. But you could buy a sweater in Reykjavik. <laughs> 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 but I, I, I think it's the worst journey I have ever encountered in my life. And Jean-Marc and I sustained each other throughout this journey with, uh, if, I think if he hadn't been there, I would have perished. And uh, I really appreciated it. With Jean-Marc, uh, with Jean-Pierre Vintenberger, um, in fact, we do have one paper together, one joint paper with Sujata, which I want to say a little bit about um, before I begin talking about the other subject. That, so let's suppose I have a, f a finite extension f of q and I have an abelian variety a, whoops, defined over f, and I take any prime p, and then I look at the field f infinity, which is f adjoin the p power division, all the p power division points, the coordinates of <coughs> p power division points on the curve, and I'm going to write g for the Galois group of this extension f infinity over f. Now, around about 1960, I think, Sayre proved that the cohomology groups HI of G acting on AP infinity are finite for all I greater than or equal to naught. I've forgotten why, exactly why he wanted this theorem, but the, his, the, the proof is not at all. Uh, I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting theorem that he proved. And curiously, when I had been, I was study, had been studying the Iwasawa theory of A over this field F infinity, and in particular, when you came to compare uh, compute the, well, let's assume that now for simplicity that G, well, no, it's, vi it's vital for now, that G has no element of order P. And so it has finite P cohomological dimension. Then if you study the, the Iwasawa theory of the Selma group, the P infinity Selma group, of A over the field F infinity, and you compute its Euler characteristic, you see that to have it consistent with what you would expect from the conjecture of Birch, and assuming that Shah is finite and there are no points of infinite order, that you have to prove 
that chi g of a p infinity, the Euler characteristic, right? The, the of the cardinality of the h i g a p infinity to the minus one to the i, you have to prove that this is equal to one. And I, I asked Sarah, and he said he had no idea whether this was true or what. But then, in fact, Sujata and I discovered that there was a very simple proof of this fact. And we, it, that in, it's, we have a little comp unit where we set it out. I'm not going to talk about the proof, but it, it's very, very simple. It uses Emi's theorem and some other basic facts. But, um, it was actually very easy, and so we were very pleased. And then naturally, well, so that where Jean-Pierre Vanton Berger intervened, was that we were, this, this, well, <coughs> I, I, Sujata and I were at um, Misery, Misery in, in California, and uh, Jean-Pierre, I think, was actually down the hill out of Misery in Berkeley. But he asked the question, what happens if you take, instead of a, if you now take F, the analogous question for F to be a finite extension of QP? What happens? So, th in fact, in this case, th th there is, n to my knowledge, there is no application. It doesn't come into the Iwasawa theory. But you see rather easily that, I that in fact, the even the analogue of Sayre's theorem is not always true, that you have to at least assume that A has potential good reduction. over f, and again you have to assume, of course, to talk about Euler characteristics, that g has no element of order p. And it turns out that, and this is the paper we wrote with Jean-Pierre, but, but it was really a great deal of the, most of the, because it's very difficult to prove, so in fact it's still true, the theorem that we prove in this paper, that subject to these conditions, a has potential good reduction, that even locally, of course, G now is, is the Galois group of the local field, chi G A P infinity is one provided A has potential good reduction over F. But the proof it is really, really quite difficult, and there are many side things that came out of it along the way in this, in this paper we wrote, and it was a great pleasure, I must admit, working with Jean-Pierre on that paper. So that was my one time in which I really worked closely with him. And I, I, I had looked at his one or two of his other papers carefully, but it was, it was indeed very striking and very nice that the work we did together on that. So, what I want to talk now is to get back to this Iwasawa theory that, in fact, as I said, suggested to us the global form of this theorem, although I'm not going to discuss that. But before I do that, I want to go back into the history a little bit to remind you of, of the background. So I'm going to be just talking about the case now, from now on K, well, Q, will be a prime always which is congruent to 7 modulo 8 and K will be the imaginary quadratic field Q adjoin the square root of minus Q 
And, and of course, this condition here, this will be vital for the, the whole theory that I want to talk about. This tells us that two splits in K, two o OK will be the ring of integers of K, and two OK will always be a product of two primes, P and P, two, two distinct primes, because of this condition. And I, let, I suppose I've fixed an embedding of K into C. Now, in 1838, Dirichlet, who of course was a Frenchman, um, I think he grew up in Germany, under, but his parents were moved there by Napoleon, I believe. And, but he spent mu much of his life in, in uh, Berlin because he was married to, to the daughter of Mendelssohn. And it was only very late in life he was Gauss's successor at Göttingen. But this is theorem, this marvelous theorem I want to prove, he actually proved much, well, I think he died about 1850, so it's, he proved the following theorem. So let me write H, I'll need it in what follows. H will be the class number. And he proved the theorem, which is the model for all that follows, uh, that I'm going to talk about, is that H is, he, he gives, gave this marvelous formula for H. It's R minus N, where you look at this, so what are R and these two integers, R and N, so you look at the set from 1, up to Q minus 1 over 2. And R is the number of quadratic residues of squares mod Q in this set. And N is the number of non-squares. modulo Q. So you see this is an exact formula for the order, test it out yourselves, Q equals 7 and so on. And in fact let me point out, so it's proven, in fact this right hand side here is essentially L chi 0 where chi is the character of the imaginary quadratic field. And I want to point out that not only has no one ever proven this formula without using combining L functions in arithmetic, but no one, it, of course, it implies in particular that R is always strictly greater than N because the, the class number is a positive integer. And no one has ever proven, has never found an elementary proof of this fact. So this is a, a very remarkable formula. What does it mean, elementary, in the sense of not using L functions, mm -hmm. not using the Well, e elementary without you mining, without using L functions or some equivalent limiting process. It's, it's completely unknown. After all, it, it should be a it's purely arithmetic statement that R should be greater than N, but there should be some arithmetic proof, but we don't know any. And... Curiously, it, it seems that, well, with the possible exception of Eisenstein, none of Dirichlet's, Dirichlet himself died soon after. He went, was in Göttingen. His wife first died, then he died. But um, of his, his students, I think only Eisenstein perhaps came close to guessing that there was some analogue of this formula for elliptic curves. So that's what I want to talk about now in the rest of my lecture. So, uh, of course, and this was the great discovery of Birch and Swinnett and Dyer, that there is such a formula but with many different features that I'll be talking about in the rest of my lecture. So 
Uh, of course, they, they, their formula works for any abelian variety over a number field, but I'm just going to s talk to what is perhaps the simplest case, and where certainly we know by far the most about the, the conjecture, namely that I want to now, so K will have a, H will, capital H will be the Hilbert class field. Of K. Of course, amongst these fields that I'm looking at, um, only Q equals 7 is the only one with class number 1. All the rest have class number bigger one than 1. And this degree here, of course, is H. So I'm going to be interested in elliptic curves E defined over H with complex multiplication by the whole maximal order of k, of k. That's, that's what I want to talk about. I mean, it's also a very interesting question to talk about, well, I'll say perhaps a little bit about that later, when, when for other imaginary <coughs> quadratic fields in these two. But just to give you some idea of, before I, I mean, later on I will write down one analogue of this formula. But let me just tell you the, the most elementary thing which comes out of a very special case of it, which I, I, so it's a curious consequence of this conjecture, which just involves these imaginary quadratic fields. So let me define now the field L, which is going to be K, adjoin the square root of minus the square root of minus q. Perfectly honest quadratic extension of k. And I'm going to, so what, are, what primes ramify in there? Well, of course, q does. But in, in addition, let me suppose you see just one, I have, I have to pick a sign of square root of minus q, and so I'm going to let the p be the one with ord p is 1 minus the square root of minus q over 2 being positive. That will, once you fix the, the, the sign of square root of minus q, this determines one of these primes completely. So p will be here, and now it's a little exercise in a, algebraic number theory to see that it's precisely, I mean, apart from Q, this prime P ramifies in here, and of course, this is a degree two, so it's with ramification index two. P is over two, right? Sorry? P is over two. The, the, the guppy P is a prime over two. <coughs> it's, it's, it's one. Yeah, yeah, right, as usual, I mean, here. Two, 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 two okay is P B bar, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So now, let's. So this is a a totally imaginary quartic extension of Q, and so its unit group, its its classical unit group, will have rank one. And I'm going to write eta for a fundamental <coughs> unit. of the field L. And now I can look at eta, it's a global element, but I can look at in the completion, eta lies in LV, the completion of L at V at this ramified prime, and therefore I can, there I can also take its logarithm, logarithm of V of eta is of course the sum from n greater than or equal to 1, of minus 1 to the n minus 1, eta minus 1 to the n over n. So we have this element always of the completion at v. Now I want to tell you the, the theorem which comes out of part of the Bert Swinnett and Dyer conjecture. It states that if the prime q 
is congruent to 7 modulo 16, then the order at V of the logarithm of eta is always exactly 2. Of course, we don't, we don't have any really nice formula for log eta, for eta or anything like that, but whatever happens, the order has to be exactly 2. It, it turns out this is equivalent to a statement about a certain component of a Tate Shepherd. Yes? Uh, you are, you are, could you say that on eta the log series converges, and if so, why? Well, because, I mean, if it's congruent to 1. Eta is certainly congruent to 1 modulo, uh, modulo V. There's no problem about it converging. What is not obvious is what is its order. But now, uh, let me make a conjecture. So this is just half the primes congruent to 7 mod 8, that if Q is congruent to 15 mod 16, which is the other half of the primes, then ord V log V eta is always strictly greater than 2. But I can't prove this statement, but I, I think it's true. I mean, it's, it turns out to be equivalent to a certain component of the tate shefferovich group of a certain elliptic <coughs> curve that I'll be writing down is non-trivial. And um, anyway, but I have no idea how to, to prove this statement in an elementary way. You know, uh, you can fool around with it as much as you like. I can't find an elementary proof. Okay, so now that's, so that's to give you just one down to a thing which, uh, by the way, you can think of this as another way of thinking this is an exact form of the viadic brouwer ziegel theorem because this ramification index is always two and so you get that the order uh, it's, it's an exact form of the, of the brouwer ziegel theorem. I don't know any other um, piadic exact statement of it like that. Okay, so now I want to... My heavens, when did I start? Court two. Yeah, well anyway, let me go. now hurry on. So the first question is, so I'm interested, I've told you in these curves E up here, which are defined over the Hilbert class field. Uh, of course, there are none. So let me make a remark. So fact, classical theory of complex multiplication, that H is in fact K adjoined J of OK. Well, now here you see I'm thinking of of OK as a lattice. It is, of course, we've picked an embedding in the complex plane, and so you can take its, it's the modular function, J, is a, in the upper half plane. So th this is a, class, a very classical theory of complex multiplication. Of course, I think Kronecker was also a student of Gauss, in fact, I believe. It's Kronecker's Jürgen Traum. I'm not quite sure who, whether he proved it. Now, So we want to write down the all the curves which E defined over H with this property here. And the first thing we want to do is to write down the simplest one, right? I want to write an equation. So far, I don't think we've had a single equation in the lectures so far, but I want to write one. And curiously, it's not as far as I know in the literature, so definition although the sort of background to it is classical. So this was discovered by a young Chinese mathematician and myself, Yongxiong Li, and it's in a paper we have on the archive. So D is going to, I'm going to call it D, is the elliptic curve y squared equals x cubed minus, now you'll forgive me for writing 
these negative powers when I say something about it. J of OK, so this is the J function to the one third. Now here, I want, there is a real root of J of OK. J of OK is real, there's a real root, so I'm taking the real root cube root there, plus 2 to the minus 5, 3 to the minus 3, J of OK, minus 12 cubed to the one half. And it doesn't matter really which, which uh, square root I take here. Now it's, it's not obvious that, in fact, this is defined over H by classical theorems from the theory of complex multiplication by classical results of Weber and Sungen. Do you have an x in the equation? Ah, I'm sorry, I've left out, there of course there's an x here. Thank you. So what's interesting about this curve, I mean, it's, I believe it's the simplest elliptic curve with complex multiplication with these properties. One, why is it? Well, for one thing, it certainly has complex multiplication because the J invariant of the curve, J of D, it's a simple calculation. I leave it to you to check that it's J of OK. So that tells me there is complex multiplication. Uh, secondly, what's interesting about it is that the discriminant of this equation, delta of D, I leave it to you, it's a little exercise, is 1. So the only primes of bad reduction are the primes dividing 2 and 3. And it's even not quite obvious a priori that there is such a, such a curve even exists uh, with more sophisticated machinery. So the J, the coefficients that you have written like this, Sorry? The cube root and the, and the square root are, are, are in C, they are not in, in H. Understand it? No. no, no, the coefficients here, this is this theorem of Weber and Sungen. The, the, these, there is a, uh, a cube root of J of OK, which belongs to H, and a square root of this, which belongs to H. This is the theorem of Weber. In fact, this theorem is true, certainly for all k of discriminant prime to h, to 6, sorry. That, that, that it's still defined over h for all such it doesn't matter. All you need is it's, it's prime to 6. And now it's a simple general fact because, of course, we only have plus or minus. There are no cubic or quartic twists here. So the fact is that every E defined over H with... and H E equals OK is of the form, is a quadratic twist of D by some alpha in H cross, which is not a square. Right? In other words, the equation of it is the same as, as if you just put the alpha here. It's a quadratic twist. So that's the complete description of all these curves. And, well, we're interested in their arithmetic. So the first thing is, it's, is the, the important theorem of Deuring, well, and one should say Deuring and Hecker, because Hecker proved... I mean, the 
actual L functions are L functions with Grossman characters that they have an, that, that, that L, so the complex L series, L E over H S is entire and satisfies its good functional equation. So there's no problem at all with the complex L series of these curves. And now I can push that up there and bring this down. Sorry? I miss up something here. So, it's, so classically, the Galois group of H over K permutes the different possibilities of. I'm sorry, the, the Galois group of? The Galois group of H over K, which is, which is order is H. So this, this uh, sends an E. So J of E, so this sends J OK to J of some ideal. And so you get another curve over H. Well, look, don't let me waste it. I mean, this is an elementary exercise. Don't, don't let me. Uh, another elementary question, I'm sorry. Uh, how do you twist by an element of the field? Uh, you take out, well, if it's a twist, if you like, by the quadratic extension, H cross H adjoin the square root of alpha. Yeah. And and uh, well explicitly you would just put the alpha on the left hand it's alpha its equation is alpha y squared equals the right hand side. Yeah. Okay, so now um, what you'd expect the conjecture one important case of the conjecture of BSD to tell one would be the following two statements. Firstly, that uh, L E over H one is non zero if and only if E H and sha e over h are both finite. So of course the Tate-Shavarevich group is the most infamous, let me remind you what it is, even though it is the most mysterious and infamous group in the whole of mathematics. Sha of e over h is the kernel of H1, H, E to the product over all V of H1, H, V, E. It's always conjectured to be finite, but um, the only time we can prove it would be in some situation like this where the L function gets involved, and uh, I mean, there's conjecture here. Secondly, there's the, the Birch, there's an exact formula for, I'm going to write down an important case at a bit later, for the order of Shah E over H in terms of, very roughly, of L E over H 1. So this is what Bertrand Swedendier <coughs> would be telling. One, one Im the first important example of Bertrand Swedendier in this case would be these two statements. Now the first comment I want to make to you is that we have no idea how to prove this in this generality. The, um, the reason is that we have to introduce, to, to tackle this conjecture, we have to introduce what I'm going to call the Abelian hypothesis.
Namely, that if you look, if you adjoin to H, the coordinates of all the torsion points on the curve, well, of course, because there's complex multiplication, you get an abelian extension of H. But what we're going to insist on is that actually this is an abelian extension. of K. And it's well known that not all curves satisfy this property. In fact, the, in our, well, in our case, the, the ones which, do, certainly which we'll be interested in will be, which do, well, firstly, it's a lemma, if you like, that D, this curve I wrote down here, which I said I believe is the simplest such curve with complex multiplication, D satisfies the Abelian hypothesis. And so, and thus, so does D twisted by alpha, the quadratic twist of D, obviously, if you take D twisted by alpha, but now you have to assume that with alpha, not an arbitrary element of H, but in K cross, modulo, take away, but not a square. So you have to take quadratic twists by, um, by elements of K. So these, in the end, will be the curves that I'm interested in. And now I want to write down what I believe is a, I'm going to call it a probable theorem. I want to say a little bit about the proof and some room. Oh my God. And reasons why, so I'm being brutally honest, it's not, the complete proof is not written down. We're working on it all the time, but this is joint work. It includes quite a lot of classical work. I'll say what extra work you have to do with Kazuka, Lee, Tian, and myself, that if D satisfies the Abelian hypothesis, then this is true. But you you if, hold if, that D satisfied the abelian so. Sorry? You hold you just hold that D satisfied the abelian so. And so do uh, uh, D, e, 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 e. Sorry, I mean if D alpha, that's yeah. I mean if if E satisfies the Abelian hypothesis. Let's just put it like that then um, this is true, yeah. So, I mean, we're, we're gradually writing down the, the comprehensible... The rest, you see, you, to prove a theorem like this, you have, the only way we can do it is to use the Iwasawa theory. So it means you have to do it for every prime P. And there are these difficult primes, which are the most interesting, so they occur so difficult most difficult primes are when uh, the prime p equals 2, the primes p, which divide h, and the primes of bad reduction.
And so you, there, there are many different aspects which come in once you look at these, problem, these primes. For example, the Tamagawa factors, which are there lurking there in the Birchmann and Dye formula, which Gauss never had to worry about. Of course, there are no Tamagawa factors in his class number formulae. But, um, and, but it's important for us too. We, life is a bit easier for us because for all these curves, 2 is a potentially ordinary prime because it splits in <coughs> K. And there's a lot of interesting work going on at the moment um, by other people uh, handling the situation of these difficult primes when 2 is inert or ramified in K. And that they have very uh, interesting applications, but I won't be going into that. Well, so what I want to do in the, for much of the remainder of my time is to rather, it's, my God. Well, I guess I can use this one. Yes, but... Uh, Oh, you think one can reach? <laughs> it's like trying to reach heaven. <coughs> oh yeah, one can, though, right. So, I mean, the, I, I don't want to go into the... It's a, too elaborate to talk about the, the... Of course, you have to prove a main conjecture and so on, but at least I want to talk about how this theorem applies to... Firstly, let's look at the, the curves D. So the theorem, so of course, to apply this theorem, you have to have the non-vanishing theorem. That, that, um, and the first theorem, which was proven by Lee and myself, is that in fact it's true L d over h1 is non-zero for all primes q congruent to 7 mod 8. That, um, again, in fact, we use Iwasawa theory to prove this. I don't know how to prove it in any other way. Um, but it, it turns out to fall out rather nicely out of the Iwasawa theory. In fact, let me mention here, I told you that the curve D, there you can see it there, makes sense for any, it's defined over H, for any imaginary quadratic field of discriminant prime to 6. And I really wonder whether or not the same statement holds for all of these. So then, in other words, that would be that all of these, these, this strange family of minimal curves would have, in particular, finite mod LV group. But I don't know the situation. We haven't really tried hard to prove it, but um, it's interesting. So now, what I want to do is to at least tell you the exact Birch Swinnerton Dyer formula in this case and talk about some numerical examples. So, what is the exact? So, we know that by our theorem that Sha a probable theorem, Sha d over h, is finite. What is this exact order? And remember, this is the order of a God-given group. So even one prime of two being, one power of two being out destroys everything. But here's the answer. So two, remember two splits in K into P, P bar. And now remember ord P of 1 minus the square root of minus q over 2 is strictly positive. That's how we, we pick the sine of square root of minus, or pick gothic p, if you like. And in fact, now it's a little exercise. I leave it to you to check that 
well, let, let W1 through WR be the primes of H above Gothic P. So of course R depends on the, the order of the ideal class group of Gothic P. And now it turns out, it's again a little exercise, that D, that these are the bad primes. These are the bad primes for D over H. There are at, at the other, the primes above B Gothic P bar and the primes above 3. In fact, it's a little exercise to check there is good reduction. And the, the Tamagawa factor at each of these primes is in fact of order 4. 2. This is not quite obvious, but it's, it's well known and not, not too difficult. Well, it's a little bit difficult to prove, but it is for every Q. So now let me introduce the period term omega Q. So this is going to be essentially the... the real period of uh, D over H, but I'm going to use the chowler selberg formula in it. So here, and I've got to give you an exact formula, so it turns out to be 2 pi to the minus M, Q to the minus H over 2, and then the product over the C's between naught and Q, which are squares modulo Q of the gamma, gamma C over Q. And what is the M here? M here is in fact, an integer, as you think about it for a moment, since h is odd, q minus 1 is over 4 minus h over 2. So that's the relevant period, and now the, the theorem, well, let me again, because I've only called the other a probable theorem, is that for all primes, I mean this is primes Q of course, mod 8, we have the exact order of Sha of D over H is L D over H evaluated at 1 over omega Q squared square root of Q. All of these, if you look at the, I mean, these are very recognized. These are, this is the discriminant of H over Q and so on. Here, the square root Q. But, um, and now finally, we have here 1 over 4 to the R, that's the Tamagawa factors at our bad primes, and then we have this extra power of 2, 2 to the H plus 6. So th this is the exact formula, and uh, happily some colleagues, Dabrowski and others in Poland, were able to compute it and what we find out, which is not at all trivial, of course. In fact, they, um, they computed this L value and the conjectural order of Sha for all primes Q congruent to 7 mod 8 
and um, Q less than, oh, I think it's about roughly 4,000. I've forgotten the exact figure. I'm sorry, I should have dug it out of the paper, but I haven't got it here. And so they compute the order of Sha d over h for all these primes. You see, it's not at all <coughs> obvious how to... I mean, you can only compute these... L because remember, h now is... One of them is... A, in a, the, the, the class number is getting large. So in fact, the h... One of these h is of a degree, I think, 170 over q. So it's really remarkable. This is work of Dabrowski and two other of his colleagues with unpronounced, unspellable names, which I won't write down, but I can tell anyone who wants, who's interested. Um, and of course, we know that the one theorem out th that are known about the tate shafarevich group, apart from this conjecturally exact formula, and is that it, the theorem of Castles and Tate, that its order must always be a square of an integer. And uh, happily, they find that that's true. And in fact, they find the first few examples, this is zero for q equals 7, 23, 31. And, sorry? One, one, it's a group. No, the order. Ah, sorry, the order, yeah, Shah is, okay. You're absolutely right. Excuse me, senility. And but the order of sha d over h for the next prime is three squared for q equals forty-seven and h equals five. So these are actually, then, then the orders of Shah, they tend to grow very rapidly. Um, but, but these again sort of give evidence, for, intuitive evidence for being this being the simplest such curve with complex multiplication because as soon as you take others, I'm going to say a word about some others in a, in a moment, um, like the ones considered by Dick Gross in his thesis. Let me say a word about them now to finish. So, definition, <coughs> let's take A now to be the curve D twisted by minus the square root of minus Q. Always this mysterious twisting coming in. So these are, these are now actually defined, A is defined over... even over H, but even Q adjoin J of OK. And, um, well, if you, the, the orders of this, for small Q, I mean the smallest Q, namely, uh, well, for 7 it is 1, but uh, once you get beyond that, the, the order of Shah have been, conjectural order have been calculated by various people, and it, it, it's enormous. It goes off very rapidly. So the last theorem I want to mention is the following, that we would like to have... So, by the way, Relic proved that L A over H1, the, the analogue long ago, by complex methods, whereas we're using two attic there, that this is non-zero for all Q congruent to 7 mod 8. So we do know that these L over H or H are non-zero, but in fact Lee and I discovered that there is a very big family of quadratic twists of these for which we can prove the L function of the A's. Namely, just let me write it down, let, let me call curly M to be the set 
of all positive <coughs> rational m, which integers which are square free and whose prime factors are congruent to 1 mod 4 and inert in K. So let's take M to be the set of all these integers and then the theorem that that Lee and I have proven is that for all M generalization, well, assume <coughs> Q <coughs> is congruent to 7 modulo 16, so it's only half the Qs, then for all M in M L A M over H one is non zero. We have all these quadratic twists. And I think what's interesting about the proof is that you really it's the first time I've seen it, but you really do have to study the Iwasawa theory, not just of A, but of the abelian variety B, which is the restriction of, this is Vey's restriction of scalars from H to K of A. So B has dimension H. It's a CM abelian variety, of course. And it, it has a large ring of endomorphisms. Of, of, uh, but rather, I don't have time to go into the proof of what, why, but you have to use the Iwasawa theory of B. I do not know how to prove this if you just work with the Iwasawa theory of A. Um, and I don't have time to go into it. But let me end with a numerical example. You might say, well, does this theorem hold for such twists of D? So, in fact, I claim that when Q is 23 and M is 901, which is 17 <coughs> times 53, which are primes. So this is in M, that L D m over h, 1 is 0. In fact, numeric I mean, you can prove it's 0, but numerically, it looks as though it has a 0 of order 6. Now, you might say, why 6? Well, you see, after all, 23 has class number 3. And it's a little exercise using the restriction of scalars to see that the, the rank of any curve in this, with complex multiplication, say by Q, Q squared minus 20, the integers of that, that it must be divisible by six, at least um, twice, uh, divisible by two H, you see. And here it seems, so it's, since the H is going off to infinity very rapidly, you are getting I mean, I believe that there are infinitely many M like this, say, for this case. So, so and similarly, as you go up to larger ones, but, but of course, we can't, we can't prove that. Um, and in, in, even in this case, we can't, the, well, I haven't been, but the, the numerical people can't find the point of infinite order. There should be six independent ones, but they can't find it. But uh, that the, the L function appears to have a zero of order six is absolutely no doubt. So, uh, uh, by the way, our model theorem will, of course, apply to these curves here. When it's finally, the proof is finally written down. Let me finish here. Thank you.
Yeah. How do you cook this? The, the, this which one? This one, yeah. <coughs> well, it, as it turns out, that the the the, the Iwasawa <coughs> there's a relevant Iwasawa module over the field that you get by joining the Gothic P infinity yes. division points and to, to H. And it turns out we can prove that that module is zero uh -huh. by a Nakayama's lemma type argument. It, it all boils down to that. So that amounts to, by Bertrand Swinnerton Diary, if you like, that, a, that, the, that the, even this certain component of the tate shafarevich group of either the restriction of scale or the A over, the, they have the same tate shafarevich group, of course, over this large field is actually zero. So there are no piadic L functions? Of course there are piadic L functions, Sorry. but they're units. Uh -huh. yes. and, and that's vital in this, I mean, they're, they're, the values are units. Uh -huh. They're units in the Iwasawa algebra. That's what you prove, yeah, For, out of the main conjecture. And uh, other question, uh, uh, what could the uh, Dirich Lessy of the Birch Finderton Dyer conjecture? You said something to this effect, no? Sorry? Uh, you, said, you said that, the, uh, yes, Dirich Lessy, no, Eisenstein had an inkling of the uh, BSD conjecture. Well, no, he didn't. Uh, to be fair to Birch Finderton, there's no evidence. What uh, Eisenstein did, as Weib points out in his book, is that he, he did calculate for, for the curve, just one curve, I think, y squared equals x cubed minus x, the value at s equals 1, okay. where it is non-zero. So there's absolutely no evidence, and of course he died very soon, there's no evidence that, you see, for, for Dirichlet, Dirichlet proved his L, his L values are never zero. I don't think it probably even <coughs> occurred to Eisenstein or anyone else that these values could be zero. You see, this is a a different world of, of why Bertzman and Dyer is infinitely more subtle. But we shouldn't forget the enormous step Dirichlet made in proving these theorems and getting us going. I think uh, Olivier yeah. had a question. Yeah, I have two really good questions. So the, the first one is about the la very last thing you said, that yeah. the numerical people cannot find the points. Yeah. So usually this indicates a large sharp, right? Sharp, large or if you cannot find a point numerically. Right, but I mean... Here, here you said as well that you were expecting a large sharp. So, so my, my, the common question is so why, I mean, do you have any um, conjectural or actual idea of what contributes to the size of sharp? No. But, but I mean, all the numerical evidence is that the, the order of, sh as you look in a family of quadratic twists of any elliptic curve, over a number field, the order of Shah goes off to infinity <coughs> with the, the uh, it's not like real quadratic fields, for example, where you, you know, you presumably there are I probably infinitely many with class number one. This is not the situation, it seems, with Shah, but we, we know nothing except numerical data. Sorry, you had a second question? No, it's, uh, it's uh, the same. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Yes. Ah, totally a different question. What is the family connection between Dirichlet and Bartholdi Mendelssohn? <laughs> ah, Dirichlet married the daughter of... The daughter? The daughter of her, yes. Not the sister. I'm sorry, it's the daughter, yes. Well, uh, no, it's, it's Mendelssohn's sister, and they were both children of the Bartholdi Mendelssohn family. I think it's Mendelssohn's sister. Which Mendelssohn? Yeah, is Look, you look it up on the internet. But, uh, and it's very tragic, you see, she, after he was finally appointed to Göttingen, she died very rapidly at very early age, under 50. And he appears to, and he died very soon afterwards. Um, so, uh, so very sad. But, but I think they lived together long before that, in, for many years in Göttingen, in Berlin, sorry.